Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. <laughs> what? What's up? <laughs> How you doing, James? I'm pretty good. How you doing, Nick? I'm good. We've been with each other for the past seven days straight, and are you tired of me yet? I haven't <laughs> washed my hands since. What? <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> James, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> He's going crazy. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, we had the weekend apart. Yeah. Thank God. And uh, But other than that, yeah. Working. We're working. We're yeah. working. We're working on some, some, some cool projects. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, how was, how was your past week? Not too bad. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm doing that, that no gram thing. That's right. I wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> I, I'm really excited. I kind of have been holding off the question this entire week because we've been in the same offices and freelancing and stuff yeah because I, I i am very curious to hear your experience of deleting your instagram if you missed it last episode james decided to delete his instagram off of his iphone yeah now it's not like a full cleanse he didn't delete his whole instagram he you allowed yourself to still get on instagram through your ipad and your yeah. computer yeah but you deleted all of your social media off your phone and how do you feel i want to hear your experience well I mean, I can only liken it to the time that I quit Facebook in college. I During college, I realized how distracting it was, and I wanted to focus on design school. And so I delete, I not only like just left my account, I completely deleted it, like permanently deleted it. Is it still deleted? It. I made a new account. I had to make a new Got account it. once Got I it. left college. But yeah, it was, I mean, I found it super beneficial, but you know, at first your, your inclination, like I can remember back then my inclination, like as soon as I opened a browser window was to start typing it in. Right. You just type F and it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're just like, oh, you know, so I still, I think I mentioned this on the last podcast that there were still, there's still moments of sort of that, that, that bore, boredom feeling that uh, Jacob talks about, Myron, where where you're like, you, you don't necessarily have anything else to do. And so you end up jumping on Instagram. And there's like you're, definitely you're, been... You're in an elevator. You're like waiting for the subway. So you yeah. pull out your phone. In the elevator. Yeah. Sitting on the subway. Like there's... And so now what do you do? I just sit there in silence and... Uh, and the ask people about their days now i um but yeah it's uh it's been interesting i don't think that i'm fully cleansed okay and so that's why i'm interested in doing it for a full month um but i definitely feel like i i feel like the lack of uh you know all of this imagery that I, that i used to be inundated with has been relaxing mm, okay. to to just get that out of my life for a little bit because as we were talking about the last time we're just inundated with imagery right especially as designers and especially with the way that i've curated my follower list which is basically no curation at all it's <laughs> it's just it's just following a lot of your, accounts yours, your list is the opposite of mine yeah right right and so it has been a breath of fresh air to not have at least that part of it. Now, if I like quit Pinterest and Lemonouche and, and all of it, that would be interesting. Go just go into the woods for to see for a year to see what you would produce. Right, that's interesting. Um, I've always thought about that too. I've always thought about like just like dropping everything, saving up, moving out into the middle of nowhere, like buying a plot of land, essentially somehow figuring out how to live off of like, I don't know, $20,000 a year or something yeah. super slim yeah. that you could easily make online or something like that. Right. And, and just like, I don't know, disconnect. Yeah, I think in instead of like speckles, you would end up with speckles that look like pine needles. Oh, like the like the CMF thing? Yeah. That's funny. Um, I will say after last week's episode about quitting Instagram, I mean, I definitely didn't quit I'm still on Instagram. I have like toned it back. Uh, and like I had mentioned previously at the beginning of the, the, the month or beginning of January, I uh, stopped pa- Patreon, which is kind of nice because there's not that explicit uh, 
deadline of, hey, I actually do have to create this content because also there has to be behind the scenes content for Patreon. Mm-hmm. But you you inspired me to, um, you know, take a step back and try to tone my Instagram usage down. And right. I uh, set my lock on Instagram. You know how the iPhone has the screen time lock? And I set it up so that I actually had to enter a passcode. Mm. And so for the first day I did that, I did it for like two hours. Easily hit my two-hour limit at like, you know, 7 p.m. And uh, then I just like was like, well, what do I do now? Yeah. I'm curious because I I know that you're going through every post. Yes. But how exactly are you reaching the two-hour threshold? Is it the, dedicated times of of viewing? So so bef- so for a long time before I set this this limit just recently, I would you know look through my all my posts, all all the people on my feed, watch all the stories, and then also I was constantly messaging people. Um, you know, there's just a lot of people that message me about all kinds of things. And also, a lot of my friends are just messaging me, too, instead of, like, on my iMessage. Right. Um, So, it was a little bit of everything. But I also looked at the Discovery page, which is just the... Mm. Or the Explore page, where you just see, like, everything that's been posted in the world. And a lot of it's, like, memes and, like, videos. And a lot of it's pretty much junk. Right. Um, But it's really addicting. And uh, But after I set that two-hour limit, you know, that discovery that like kind of the last uh hit of dopamine was like uh oh i i really shouldn't be watching discovery because if i don't if i don't have uh enough time to watch everyone's posts then i'll be missing out so i i definitely have like every time i'm on discovery page i'm like oh no i shouldn't do this this is a waste of time my (laughs) timer is ticking yeah and uh no it's it's been good i feel like that first day it like cut me off at two hours i felt very uh very much like wait a second this is it's like it was kind of like uh like if you're like running a marathon or something and i don't know it's like a pain but a good pain in a way right yeah Yeah, i I, and you and i talked about this a little bit off the pod and it's something that i've been wondering about and i and maybe it's because uh i've seen spencer nugent posting a lot about Oh man, Facebook Facebook is uh is infecting Instagram. You know, because Facebook owns Instagram. Right. Mm-hmm. And so is Instagram getting better or worse and will we have to find a new platform? I mean, that's certainly a big question. I think with any really with anything nothing ever lasts forever, right? So eventually Instagram will fade into what will probably be I envision uh, VR or some sort of more augmented. I, who knows? Yeah. Um, or or social media in general. Like I don't. I don't think. I don't think we're gonna go straight from Instagram to VR. I think just like as social media tends to fade out, it'll probably transform into some sort of virtual social media. Yeah. But um. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always talk about around like the Instagram algorithm. Um, that's a common thing that people like to talk about. Of like, oh, you know, your post didn't reach that many people because the algorithm did whatever it's changed uh i i think in general and i've I've looked into this a good bit like generally instagram just is growing so there's Mm. more people on there there's more people posting more content and by default you know you're going to be a lesser percentage of those people right right um and so people are just always following more more and more people yeah so just by math you're going to get less likes because people aren't going to see those posts. Like, right. Like you, James, you follow however many thousand people and you don't see every post. No. What I did find interesting was after my hiatus back in November, I posted, I did a couple posts. I, I think two, well, I did two posts, one a time lapse of sketching and then doing my iPhone rendering and then another one of a new helicopter and they seem to have further reach than posts that I had, that I had, you know, when I was posting more consistently. Yeah. And I wonder if the algorithm is pushing those posts because of the infrequency. I, it, it very well could be. It's very much a black box. Yeah. Instagram ha- and Facebook and Instagram have an, 
I think released some sort of uh, parameters around the algorithm. Like it's a factor of who you interact with. It's a factor of what you like. And it's like a factor of, I don't know, who you mess with. There's, there's a lot of different parameters that go into it. Right. Um, but I'm sure that's one of them of like how frequently you post. And, oh, this guy hasn't posted in a while. Let's he, And he posts something recently. Let's boost it up. Yeah. And I, and I feel like, I, I hate to be a cynic, but I do feel like that push of of somebody's content who's been off for a while and and getting the reach and the likes mm-hmm. is is kind of a way to reel you back in that's true to posting it's a it's a yeah strategy i can um, see for sure but uh yeah i don't know i i i don't think that i'm going to miss instagram at the end of the month and i think that it will end up being something where i'm either kind of not really that interested in engaging with it as much anymore or i like happen to get back into it and get back into the addiction Hmm. pattern because it's designed to be addictive it's designed to be the slot machine i mean this has been discussed by a lot of people for sure Um, but uh yeah so Anyway, we'll see what happens at the end of the month, and I'll give a full report. Yeah, I'm excited to see. I I definitely, as well, am like trying my own Instagram experience of experiments of maybe like posting more, uh, more pro. Like, I think we were talking about last week where we were talking about how you feel that need to say or to do like, oh, what are we doing for Instagram? Right. Like, what are you gonna do for Instagram today? And I want to stop that and I want to say, what am I doing for design today? And can I take that and post it on Instagram? Yeah. Because that's what, that's my, that's my real job. You know, like I'm designing, we'll just post if it's a doodle, if it's a mock-up, if it's a, whatever it is. I don't yeah. know. What am, what am I doing for the great gods <laughs> of design? Um, uh, another update. Yeah. A, a big, well, I, an, an announcement. I don't know if it's big or not, but we... Uh, announcement! <laughs> well, announcement! a couple of things. First of all, thank you guys for listening. We love you guys, and we want you guys to be more interactive, and we try to, we've tried to think of ways to have you guys interact with the voicemail and things like that. And uh, I've actually heard of a couple podcasts starting a Discord. Mm-hmm. Dis- Discord is this new chat... Well, it's actually not a new chat room. I think it's started out as a gaming chat chat room platform mm. online but it's also expanded into other areas yeah recently i, I like i was listening to like two d- separate podcasts today and they were like just starting their own discord as well huh. um so i'm we're gonna start a discord yeah or we have started one you can check it out uh we'll put a link in our bio on instagram which is at minor details pod yeah um and we'll probably post a story about it as well but. yeah i think we just want to like like Nick is saying, we want to interact with you guys more. We want to involve you in the conversation because as you said at the end of the last podcast, and this is something that we've discussed as well, is you know, this this podcast is not about us being some sort of experts right. giving our expert opinions. <laughs> We're definitely not. We're just this is just like late night studio chit chat. Two designers just love and design. Yeah. So we want this to be a conversation and we want to hear what you guys think about the different topics that we discuss and whether you agree with us or disagree with us and why. And I think, um, you know, I think it's always a good thing to get into conversations so that you can strengthen your opinions and beliefs about things. Um, that's, that's what I get out of, out of doing this podcast is having to articulate my opinions makes me have to really think about them and think them through. And I think that that's only a benefit to that, me in my design career. It's definitely a key part of your career for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it even flows through to your design process, right? Right. Presenting ideas and forming a valid argument on why a concept is better than other concepts. Yeah. I feel like all designers should go to law school, and like <laughs> learn, learn how to formulate that good argument. That is, that's a funny, that could be another topic. Yeah. But uh, one thing that we could discuss in Discord on, you know, when we open it up is the Rams documentary. Because we've never really, although we've talked about seeing it 
we've never really talked about it. Yeah, and and I you mentioned the other day, and I realized that I don't think we actually mentioned the documentary on the podcast. Of course, Emily and I discussed meeting Dieter Rams, but we, you and I, have not discussed seeing the video, right? Um, which, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'll go and start. I think just straight off the bat, I thought the Rams documentary was good. Um, I wouldn't say like it was blowing me out of the water. Mm-hmm. I felt like Objectify did that a little bit more. Um, and uh, for the, for those who aren't familiar, the Rams documentary is a documentary about Dieter Rams, uh, pretty much the most famous industrial designer. Um, and it came out recently and, uh, yeah, I, I, there was a few things in there that, you know, I don't know if I, I really cared for and I don't know, I, I want to hear your thoughts, James, cause I know you have a few more, uh, elaborative thoughts. Is elaborative yeah. I think I made that up. I think, <laughs> I think, okay. I think there's a couple things here. I think there's, there's so much anticipation coming into a documentary like this right that it's almost it's almost doomed from the start it's like it's like if someone was to make a documentary about the beatles right that's a big feat yeah and i feel like there probably have been many many documentaries about the beatles because everybody probably feels like oh they didn't cover it correctly right 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 right. and so this is just one and the only dita rams documentary Currently. And so, I mean, it probably will be the only one. I don't yeah. know. Um, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I guess in terms of being able to have a documentary while Dieter Rams is still alive to get his thoughts. And so part of the, the other part was me going into this documentary, having read the Core 77 um, interview with Gary Hustwit, uh, which was written by Emily. And um, she conducted the interview. And I couldn't help but notice the the part of the article where Gary was sort of saying he he almost wishes that he didn't even have to talk about Dieter Ram's work. Like he he feels like everybody's familiar with the work, but he was more interested in who Dieter Rams is today and and how he has sort of, I don't know if it's a change of heart, but he has these feelings about products and consumerism and, and, you know, what Dieter Rams does. Dieter Rams. Right. And, and the legacy that he's, that he's created in, in, you know, product design. And, you know, I think all these things are valid, but part of me felt like Gary Hustwit went into filming this documentary knowing how he wanted to position the documentary, how he wanted to tell the story of Dieter Rams through the documentary, which right. was through this lens of of this this designer reflecting on his life and his work and sort of and saying things like, I if I had to do it again, I wouldn't be an industrial designer. Right. Yeah. That's a little harsh. and and so, you know, uh, my my feeling is, and I'm no document documentary aficionado, but I feel like part of a documentary as a director is isn't it going into the work not having the story. It's about going into the into the documentary process to discover the story. Mm, that's interesting. And, and so, because it's a, it's a it's documenting. It's right, you know. So it made me feel like, is this an editorial? Does is uh, it, I see what you I see what you mean. And um, I don't think that the message is necessarily one that's bad. I mean, obviously, being considerate about design is important, and and I would never advocate for otherwise. But I wanted, I wanted more Dieter and more of his history and and I just felt like the things that they chose to focus on in the film it just wasn't as compelling as I as I felt it could have been yeah that's an interesting interesting thought because now that you phrase it that way it's like the documentary should have been 
literally documenting his his life and his career as opposed to maybe some of that and then also a bit more of like you know a a here and now what's happening now in the design industry and you know with the whole sustainability and political atmosphere there was definitely a little bit of that injected into the documentary which i can see now that what you're saying is well this 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 dates the documentary now a yeah. hundred years from now it's going to be a little bit a little bit dated because of that instead of more of a historical record right and that's that's interesting i didn't i haven't thought about it that way but i i also do, do agree like i did kind of i did kind of want a little bit more of that like dirty like i wanted to see Dieter in like the prototyping lab like yeah you know carving foam or whatever yeah and there was like a few instances in there where like i i remember like one of my favorite parts was um where Dieter was talking with one of the other brawn designers and he was saying something to the effect of like oh yeah you remember when we try to glue on this like label and the other the engineers wanted to make it a sticker and we wanted it to be embedded and yeah they were like discussing this feud that they had which is like just it's nice to hear because you know we do that thing every day where we like fight for the best design and then people shoot it down and then we kind of compromise so yeah yeah it's just it's tough to see someone that is so idolized within the community uh really seem distressed by the current state of it and um i don't know i feel pretty optimistic i think that um, I don't know. I think that we're taking these lessons and we're moving forward. And my feeling is, is that with industrial design and with industrial designers is that, you know, the, we will change with the world. Like if, if, uh, if the world asks for products to be made a different way, because it'll be better for the environment, then we're adaptable. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I think that I'm optimistic about the future of industrial design because I think that technology is advancing so quickly that uh, I think that like cradle to cradle is something that's very realistic within our lifetime and it's already happening in some instances. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's, I mean, we still haven't done our sustainability episode. We'll get there one day. <laughs> We're so scared. Guys. It's just we such just, a tricky topic. We are so scared of that topic. But, but um, yeah, like we said, uh, you know, we're interested in your opinions. And if you've seen the Rams documentary, tell us what you thought about it. Yeah, on the Discord. Uh, yeah. Hit us up. I, we'll, we're going to, uh, yeah, have a conversation there. Yeah. Um, design news. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, now, I mean, this is kind of all around the blogosphere, but um, IKEA has been testing a new furniture subscription service, mm. which kind of plays off of our just last comment of cradle to cradle. But uh, yeah, um, from what I read, and maybe you can add to this, James, but you know, IKEA, I believe, was testing in in Europe somewhere. Is mm-hmm. that correct? A new uh, kind of rental type of subscription service where. Uh, I, I think it was geared mainly toward offices, mm. um, more corporate atmospheres where uh, offices could rent out furniture and then, I guess, replace it. Yeah. But I don't know. What what, what did you read? Um, I don't remember the part about the offices. I thought it was just a general IKEA, but maybe I misread. I, I know that they're, they're still in a testing phase. It's yeah. not rolled out yet. Right. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah. I think... I think it's really interesting because I think there's this there's this mindset around IKEA, especially when you're a young adult and you're collecting your you're collecting furniture, you're putting together your apartment or your room, and the, your budget is the IKEA level budget. Exactly, like you want things that look good, right. but that are within your price range, and. Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times when people move from place to place, IKEA furniture gets left behind, thrown out. Yeah, because it's so cheap. It's disposable in a way. And I think this is really, I think it's really interesting because I think, 
I don't know. I, I'm always interested when when big companies like this do do something interesting and new with their entire service. And I could see a world in which IKEA is the subscription service. And then when you get enough money, you can buy the, the that Hans Wegner chair Ooh. or Ooh. you know, that Eames lounge. Yes. But uh, you know, in the meantime, I would like to know that I'm not just, you know, we've actually repurposed a lot of things from our last apartment. We had this big IKEA bookshelf. And once we got into our new place, it didn't make any sense anymore, but we were able to dismantle it. It's kind of a modular piece and we're able to use it as like a TV stand, record player, you know, record uh, holder, um, also a cabinet for our kitchen. So, I mean, I think, I think also Ikea's products have been getting better quality over the years. Yeah, I yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, I, I think definitely a core part of this subscription service will be the quality of the products because I think about the classic, the lac coffee table and like the lac, like there, there's the, the lac modular right. system, which is like the most basic Ikea thing that you can buy. Yeah. And literally the coffee table is like 10 bucks. Yeah. And it's just made of like, like paper almost. Right. But little do you know, James, I've actually been doing the New York City IKEA subscription service. I didn't know if you know about this. New York has a IKEA subscription service. You, what you do is at the first of every month, you go and you walk down the street and man oh man, <laughs> it is free game. You can pick up whatever IKEA item you want. You want a lack coffee table? You just go down the block to the cab. You want a uh, you want a bookshelf? <laughs> you go down to uh, Lafayette, you know? Lafayette nice. Street. Um so are you saying that all of your studio equipment has been brought to you by the sidewalk subscription service? Some of it. So those two, those yeah. two shoe ranks. And yeah. then this one I bought off of uh, 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 office that was closing oh. for like 10 bucks. And then nice. this, this one was in my basement because the previous owner did the subscription service. So they left it in the basement. <laughs> But uh, yes, what I what well, I'm saying thank is thank God for people like you, Nick. Is uh, yeah, you know I'm a I'm a salvager. I go out and find those nice furniture yeah. pieces. This uh, chair, this chair, <laughs> found on the street. Yeah. All right. I'll con- I'll, let's, I'll let you continue. Cause no, no, <laughs> no. I I don't know that I have much else to add. I mean, I did see that um, IKEA recently did a collaboration with Tom Dixon. Right. They did. They did a bed. Like a oh, bed system I, with him. I saw that as well. Tom Dixon, the the British designer. Yeah, so it's it's sort of a modular piece that is intended to be, you know, a longer lifespan piece, and you can add things or subtract things that make sense for like to your life in your current situation. Mm, that's smart. Um, you know, so I think these are great things that are that IKEA is doing, and I think. For me, as soon as I read the the article, I was like, "This makes a lot of sense for IKEA. This, like this, uh, it it just it didn't seem like a far stretch. Like, yeah, I I think a lot of businesses are actually moving to this model, subscription model. Yeah, I mean, definitely millennials are very accustomed to it, and so and as we grow as the the majority population in America, it's gonna be. I mean, we're going to be a key part of the demographic. I would love to live in a world where we're basically, you can dematerialize things really easily and recreate them into new pieces because... Snap your fingers. I mean, I essentially want to app, like do an app update to my coffee table. That's pretty cool. You know? That's coming. That's coming. (laughs) VR. (laughs) Fine, fine, fine. Um, But yeah... Um, but yeah, that was our design news this week. So uh, for our topic, we wanted to tackle something a little, uh, something we've been thinking about for a while and has recently come up for me personally. Right. Um, we wanted to talk, uh, talk about our like design strategies and the design philosophies that we use in our day-to-day design. Um, or, or more personally in our design projects, maybe if it's a side project or something and when there's no parameters or clients. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll start this off because there is a story yep. here and this is a, a recent breaking news story for me in my life that doesn't really affect anything else. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have formulated this design philosophy or design idea 
called familiarism. Mm -hmm. Um, And just to briefly explain what it is, familiarism is something that I had noticed in the design world. And it's using familiar elements, uh, say if it's like a door handle or something that you're really used to, like a familiar interaction. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I got to like really define this well. But it's a familiar interaction that you can implement into a incongruous product, incongruous? Mm-hmm. Uh, some, a, a product that, has n- that y- you usually wouldn't interact with in this way to create a new or better experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I want to I want to reel it back a little bit and just tell yeah. the story of this. Yeah, um, go ahead. So you know, this whole idea I had started in school. I was, I guess, a sophomore in college, and our first design project was designing this nightlight, which I've talked about maybe on one of the first episodes. Um, and the whole idea was to design a nightlight inspired by a famous industrial designer. And so we had this whole list of industrial designers to choose from. And, of course, everyone in the class, first of all, we didn't know any of the people on the list except for Dieter Rams because he's the most famous, right? Right. And so everyone wanted Dieter Rams. I uh, went like, I I probably went last or something. I didn't get a pick Dieter. Um, (laughs) And so uh, my professor was like, yo, you should choose uh, Nata Fukusawa. Mm. He is a Japanese designer, very minimal. And I think you would appreciate his type of design, very you know, minimal and simple as Dieter Rams is. And uh, I was like, okay, sure, I'll try it out. Um, so, yeah, I did a ton of research on Nata Fukusawa, and Nata Fukusawa talks about his design language and how he takes these, like, very subtle and subconscious uh, feelings and implements them into his designs. So there's a couple examples of this. The most famous one that he has is this... Uh, muji cd player that he designed right and it's you know simply a rounded square that you mount onto your wall and then it has the power cord drapes down from the square Mm -hmm. plugs into the you know the outlet and um and then the cd just mounts straight onto the the square and so to turn it on you go over and you pull the cord there's not a button or anything you just pull the cord and the cd starts spinning and plays the music and Nata Fukusawa expands on this idea and talks about how he was inspired by the ceiling fan mm. where, you know, you walk into a room, you pull the cord on the ceiling fan, you know, the blades start spinning and you feel the breeze. And that's what he did with the music. It's like you pull the cord, CD spins, you feel the music. Yeah. And so it was like this, this familiar interaction added to this product that would never have a pull cord to create this completely new and you know arguably easier to use unique experience um and so like i was just so super intrigued by this and of course i started seeing this everywhere online in you know products that were not even not fukusawa's and i don't know there wasn't a name to it like i didn't like what do you call like that tactic of using an interaction to create this unique product. And uh, I just called it familiarism because all the interactions were very familiar, but added to like this weird or, or different product. Um, another example I, I found that I really loved was this this uh, radio. And I, I forget the company. It was like some like uh, like stock I think it was like a Swedish company or something, but, um, it was a, it was a radio and it had, it was a simple yellow cube and it had a cork on top Mm -hmm. that covered the speakers. Yeah. So when you pulled the cork out, the speakers flowed with music. Mm -hmm. Just like if you were to pull the cork out of a wine bottle. Yeah. The wine flows out. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've had this idea floating around for like, I don't know, seven years in my head, never written it down, never like, you know, made a formalized definition of it until just recently because, <laughs> because here, here's the, here's the breaking news. Um, we all know our, our uh, friend Chris Ferentz, who is a high schooler and he is an avid practicing, in, pra- uh, he, he really enjoys industrial design. He's going to go places, but um, he, in high school, 
designed this new this this product uh, called the Hammer Bank, which I'm sure you can check out online if you just search Chris Ferentz Hammer Bank. Um, it was a piggy bank that looked like a hammer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a play on interaction of, you know, you smash the bank and it, it you know, you get your coins. Right. And, and he talked to me about familiarism because, you know, we're good friends. He stayed with me in my studio for a week and I kind of explained this idea I've had. And uh, he used it in his project. Like he used the interaction of uh, using a hammer. Yeah. Added it to this different product of a piggy bank, uh, you know, incongruous product of a piggy bank to create this new experience. Right. And um, he got published on Yanko Design, which was amazing. Like, he's a high schooler. Yeah. Congrats. Um, and uh, and Yanko Design also used familiarism in the blog post, and people were like, what is familiarism? This doesn't exist. Right. There's literally 80 results on Google when you search familiarism. And so I was like, oh, shoot, I don't want to make this this kid think he's like making up words. I got to I got to write it on the Internet. Somewhere. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I don't want to. This is a long story, I know. But no, it's fine. <laughs> um, so I wrote, I'm familiar with it. OK. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I took the the past week and wrote uh, an article on my website, nicholas baker dot com backslash familiarism about what I thought familiarism was, you know, and why I kind of formulated this idea and, you know, named it this thing. And, and to be clear, this idea of using a, an interaction, a familiar interaction on a incongruous product is not new. It's mm-hmm. been done plenty of times. It just didn't have a name. Um, and I also use this idea a lot in a lot of my products. Um, so if you like look on my website, you can kind of see that that familiar vibe. Um, but you know, made this article, decided to like, you know, just let everyone know. And uh, man, oh man, did people th- did people have their comments on it? Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's you, you guys can go check it out and read it. Uh, Chris France decided to post it on the Core Saving Seven forums, mm-hmm. which is you know the OG Instagram, I guess you would call. Uh, that's where the the original industrial design community congregated online. It's essentially the YouTube comments section. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we he posted on it, and definitely people had their two cents to input. A lot of a lot of people were vibing with it, especially on my Instagram. A lot of people messaged me saying like, "Oh, I I get it. I understand. It's very uh, poignant, and like I I can see the value in it." And then there was a lot of people that were like nick what kind of pretentious crap is this you don't know anything about design philosophy why are you writing this stuff Mm -hmm. um you know very uh construction criticism might be too 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 much to even say it was it was just more criticism Mm. um there were some constructive things in there yeah Uh, but uh you know it i always i always like to think that if you get a lot of people that love it and a lot of people that hate it, you might be doing something good or bad, but at least it's not mediocre. Right. Yeah, I think... I, I mean, well, just to close this off, I just want to say... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, James. I know I've been talking for like the past 10 minutes. Um, I just want to say that regardless of what people think about familiarism, whether they think it's a real thing or, or not, or if I'm right or wrong on naming this, making up a word and naming it... Um, I will say it helped me so much to just write this down, to write my thoughts down on the screen so that I can really solidify this idea. Um, Yeah, it just helped me a lot to solidify this idea. Now that I've solidified it, I'm looking at almost object and I'm seeing that like, oh, almost object is the realization of familiarism. Right. Yes. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I am finished here. (laughs) Thoughts, yeah. thoughts, James. I know that was a long, long little speech. No, that was good. I think um, I think you're right. I think formalizing it and putting it down. Uh, I feel that the comments against, or or I shouldn't say against, but that were critical of the post. I mean, I I can I understand. I think getting feedback on on this philosophy and 
using that to strengthen it. That's a good thing. Right. So taking these comments seriously. But the other part of it is, is that I, I, I nobody's... Will... The, the other element of it is that I've never heard anybody discuss, like, if there is an existing theory about this, I've never really heard anybody discuss it openly. That's true. And, and so if, if there is a philosophy out there that's similar or, or whatever, then it should be common design language. And if people... If people are having to point it out, then it's not obvious. It's not something that we all know. Right. It's not something that we're all familiar with. Right. <laughs> you know, so I think that, you know, I I immediately when you when you talk about it, when you've when you've written it out, I understand it and I understand how I can then approach a pro a project with that in mind. Right. And so it's it's useful, it's a it's a functional definition and yeah i don't think i think that in the article you do a good job of saying this is this is you know what i feel in this moment this is this is how i define it it's it's something that is still being solidified right yeah i'm not saying this is fact at all i'm yeah. just purely you know observing my you know writing down my observations yeah and then i and then i also think I did actually get a lot of like constructive criticism. Yeah. And a lot of people like mentioned, "Hey, you should check out this article. You should check out this book where it talks about something similar." Mm -hmm. um, there was one about Raymond Lowy where Raymond Lowy talks about his Maya principle, M A Y A, hmm. which is I, I think it was like essentially you want to use familiar interactions to progress the the technology of a product. Uh, you, you don't want to ever think about Google Glass, right? Mm -hmm. Google Glass was just way too far out for people to really interact with it properly. Mm. Um, so there has to be that evolution. They have to have those familiar elements to right. evolve the technology. Yeah. So it is It is similar. But I think the very, what I'm trying to really hone is the very particular part about familiarism, which is you take the familiar interaction, and I think it, I think it should only be an interaction. It shouldn't be a form. It shouldn't be a color. It should only be an interaction. And you have to add it to an incongruous product, a product that is not usually interacted with in that way. Yeah. And it has to be to create an easier or more unique experience. Right. But yeah. I think I think one of the interesting things about it is that although it is familiar, it is not necessarily intuitive. Like those seem to be two separate things. That's interesting. Because in your example of the Naoto Fukusawa fan, it's not intuitive. You would never pull the cord of an electronic device. I mean, you would be looking around the device to try and find the play button. Mm -hmm. But because you have the knowledge of how the product works and maybe you've read the instruction manual, I think what it is is it, it becomes familiar and you make that connection, but it's and it and then it becomes this novel interaction with the device. But I think that that first time in use, it's a it's a delightful moment. It's it's a moment of discovery, right? And I think that that to me about that particular product is is a key feature of it, which which is the discovery phase. And that, to me, is what makes that product so successful is because of sort of this surprise and delight, I guess. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know if I specifically... I think I actually counter that in my article mm. and say that it should be intuitive and not a discovery. But you make a good point that the Muji radio isn't intuitive at all. Yeah. Hmm. I, I I'm definitely refining it, like we said. Like right. it still needs refinement, but um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Do you have any? I mean, we should talk about your <laughs> your ideas about des you know design and how you approach like a personal project. Yeah. If you have a philosophy, I know you like loops. You've oh, impacted yeah. me. I've been drawing loops all, all every <laughs> every since I met you. I think I mostly just have very 
small bits of philosophy, not necessarily one larger codified thing. Right. I, I will say also, like, design philosophy, I mean, at this stage, like, you know, I don't even know if you call our philosophies philosophies. They're more mm-hmm. just like practices. But yeah, I I don't use the philosophy of familiarism or the practice of familiarism in all of my products right. or with all my clients. Yeah, and I wonder, here's another conversation to have, and I'm not sure if we have enough time to have it, but sometimes I feel like I want to approach a project in a way that's not standard. And a lot of times I feel like with freelance work or with just professional industrial design work there's sort of this understood process that we all fall into like the research the sketching yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and i mean maybe that's why people start studios because they can then they can practice a different version of that they can practice their own version of that independent but it's it's so often that I feel like I want to come in to some place and and do a completely different process. And sometimes I enjoy my personal projects so much because I don't have to approach them with the uh, the established way. Right. I think the established way is obviously established because it has a history of success, but there there are times where I feel like I can shortcut a lot of things and get to a solution much faster by using very different methods. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, one, one thing that I've been trying to develop, and this is probably going to be very poorly articulated, is, is this whole philosophy of, of uh, delight. Um, and I think that it's probably... There's probably some philosophy that covers this, but my feeling is is that I, I I dislike this idea that design needs to be intuitive because I think discovery is a really wonderful part of design. Um, so I don't think that I have to approach something and just automatically know how to use it. Uh, I think you know once you purchase an item, you more or less will find out how it functions right through that process um and i also feel like there's there are things uh, i was thinking about this today like in terms of joinery methods i think a bayonet snap is more satisfying than threading like things like that there are there are different interactions what that is, we deal with. What is a bayonet snap? Bayonet snap is when it comes in and just turns and keys in. Oh. And and I think oftentimes there is sort of a snap that happens. Hmm. I think there are just certain cues that we get from design that are more satisfying than others. And I've never particularly thought that threading and threaded things and having to thread things together was particularly satisfying. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely picking up what you're laying down. <laughs> I well, I, I'm thinking of the examples of bayonet snaps. I remember, I th- we've talked about this, right? I I used to have a Wacom, a Cintiq, oh, right. pen stand, yeah. that had a bayonet snap on it, yeah, and I wanted to add that mechan. I didn't know what it was called, yeah, but, but now I do. I wanted to add that mechanism to a product I was designing. So I just shipped my bayonet pen, pen stand to China, and they added it on there. Yeah, I don't know that they always have that. They always have a uh, like a snap at the end. I think okay. they might. Some of them might just be smooth. I mean, the, it comes, the snap was the satisfying part. Though. Yeah, if if it did have the snap, I yeah, that's that's the kind of interaction that I that I'm thinking of. That's the delightful part. I think. Yeah, I mean, maybe this is just more talking about sensory things, but I think even. Even the assembly of something can be designed to be really delightful in terms of all of those sensory experiences. Mm. And and I don't think that, like, I don't really like simplicity that much because I, cause I think that there, or minimalism, because I think that there... There is room for some sort, some bit of complexity as long as it's considered in terms of those those sensory uh, sort of interactions. I agree, and and one thing I will note, and as well, I writ, wrote it in in my article about familiarism too. Is the the whole idea of familiarism was 
it was almost a departure from minimalism. Yeah. It was this this thing that added life back into min- minimalism. It was like this fun, you know, interaction, this this thing that you've never experienced before on this very simple object. Um, and I don't know if familiarism should be on a very simple design. I still haven't figured that out. But, but yeah, I, I agree. I think minimalism can be too stark at mm-hmm. times. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't, I, I can't say that I have anything totally codified. Um, you should write those ideas. Like this really helped me writing, yeah. writing this article down. And yeah. may, maybe don't pu- don't publish it because I definitely got a lot of flack for it. But just write it down on docs or something. Right, you know? right. Yeah, there's um there there's another like uh, area in which I'm very interested in, which is just like design sketching. And I am writing something about my whole philosophy or like with the loose around loose yeah Mm. continuous line drawing and why it's so important um but uh yeah i think it is important for us as designers to take note of those moments where we find something really interesting and and delightful or satisfying and and document those things like really to understand what it is we value about these about these interactions or these products and be able to yeah put, you know i don't know i i agree i think in I, we could i i kind of feel like we should just talk about this forever <laughs> cuz i'm really into this but there especially with that bayonet snap like you're saying it's this it's this idea of sliding two objects together twisting them and then you know that kind of clicks into place there's not only you know, the visual aspect, right? Like it, the two pieces connect. I think that's, uh, designers are majority visual. Like you are always thinking about how things look. Uh, that's like the first thing in your, in your mind. But we, we forget a lot, a lot about the touch, the feel, yeah. the, the sound of the snap. Mm-hmm. You, I, I know that Apple has thought about so much how their key keyboard sounds when you hit the key. Yeah, the audio design I think is important as well. Yeah, Tactile. yeah. One one thing that's really satisfying is is plugging in your charger cord into your phone. Exactly, it has a really satisfying snap. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Oh gosh, I had something. Oh. Oh gosh, I've lost my train of thought. That's okay, James. That's okay. Oh man. Well, I mean, do you, is there any other like closing thoughts? I, I mean, we could have time for one question if you had any closing thoughts. I, I did have a closing thought, and and now I'm trying to stall by by saying all these words to figure out what that closing thought was. I think I just had another thought around bayonet bayonet snaps, uh, or just like yeah, just audio. Like I think that yeah, th- there was a big push when I was in school. You know, obviously everybody, well, not everybody, but uh, you know about uh, my form exploration, all of that with Reed, um, these things that we learned in school, but we never really, we never really talked about those kind of details. And I wonder if it's appropriate in a school setting, but I, w- if I went back to school as a teacher, I would love to just do a studio where it was all about like sensory uh, other snaps. senses the other senses uh instead of visual senses yes like audio yeah tactile what taste smell those are <laughs> those are dog products dog toys right we scented them vanilla we scented the rubber to be vanilla yeah because people hate the smell of rubber oh. and you know when they would buy just this is i i this is definitely a lineage of products that have happened before i even entered the market probably before i was even born they were doing this but um yeah people would buy these dog toys and be like oh this this smells bad like yeah. this is toxic for my dog yeah it's not toxic it's natural rubber but they scented it with vanilla and the complaints went away yeah i remembered what i was going to talk about what were you going to say uh I, I we might have talked about this on the podcast before but i think the ultimate sort of failure in this arena like the thing that you could point to to say this is this is where the designers did not pay enough attention to these interactions is the fidget cube 
I like the oh the the, the kickstart sensation. Yes, because. I, I mean, and I don't know how much they were really invested in making this like the most enjoyable experience, but right. but one of the things that they left out was resistance, mm. because everything everything on the fidget cube has little to no resistance. And and, and to be to be clear, the fidget cube was this, oh yes. this Kickstarter object that had a bunch of like buttons and joysticks and essentially just like a fidget. Right. object right and it, yeah and it had no resistance it should have been like the ultimate sensory experience mm. that's what it was that's what it was billed as but there there was a there's like a switch on one side you know like a toggle switch right and it has no resistance it just like goes like back loose and, yeah and they should have known and like who knows? These could have been just totally unscrupulous product designers who were just trying to. It's a quick, quick buck. Scheme, yeah, probably. quick buck. But um, the satisfying part about a ballpoint pen is the spring resistance within it. Yes. You know, there the satisfying part of of switches are the resistance are the springs underneath that are causing that resistance to happen. Yeah. And when it lacks that, I picked up the fidget cube, like when I first got it played around with it for maybe two seconds and was like, why did I fund this? Why did I buy it? Was, it was so, so awful. Such a terrible experience. Hmm. And that, to me, really codified this, this idea of how important these sensory experiences are because otherwise your product feels cheap and it feels ill-considered. Yes. And... And nobody wants the, those kind of products in their life. Yes. Amen. Hey! Good good point, James. Okay. Um, do you think we should do one question? We can do one question, right? I think we can fit one in. Um, all right. So, also, we didn't get any... Vo- well, we got a few voicemails that were jokes. But uh, <laughs> we, we didn't get any real voicemails in this week. Uh, if you want to call in and leave us a message or leave us your thoughts, our number is one 494 uh, And, I mean, your odds of getting played are pretty high because we got we got none last <laughs> week. So, um, you know, ne- this week maybe. Um, so our, our, our question comes from Jason Klein, and they say, I'm an industrial designer working within the automotive world for a few years for Arrival.com. And I've been lucky enough to experience both sides of the fence in terms of design. I was wondering, what is your take on industrial design within an automotive world? And how transfer- transferable are the skills and thinking? What I've learned is that there are facets of each profession that can cross over and be shared. Maybe there is some kind of hybrid between both type of designers. I'm... I think working within this field has given me appreciation for things I don't necessarily would have experienced if I was working on consumer electronics. Hmm. What are your thoughts on this? That's a good question. Yeah. Definitely for, definitely really specific. Right. First of all, uh, Arrival stole our logo. Oh, um, I didn't even know this. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do have to say, I think this is a really beautiful... Uh, vehicle. Yeah, we, we we looked up arrival.com and it's a smart electric van. Beautiful design, very futuristic. I'm sure it's autonomous and all that. Oh man, it's got two volcanoes around those wheels. I love those volcanoes. Oh man. <laughs> it's uh it's got a nice little chamfer on the front. Ooh, it looks good. It looks handsome. Um it's uh, interesting though that industrial designers working at this automotive company. I, I I, I don't know much more than this email, but I'm assuming that Jason's probably doing more industrial design tasks as opposed to automotive styling. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of the way that his, his question is phrased, but I don't know. It's I, I know we've talked about a little bit of like how automotive designers tend to have that very, uh, what's the speed form mm-hmm. style of yeah. like adding those those lines, two forms, you know, those those edges to make things kind of flow and and things like that. I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts? Well, I again, I think I'm I'm rehashing something from another episode, but I I have 
I've worked with car designers turned industrial designers, people that have studied transportation design and then gotten into industrial design. And I will say that I have found their form giving abilities really impressive. And I think that they're also really good at mixing materials and, and like within large assemblies, they, they're very good at sort of, you know, knowing how to make really quality um, decisions when it comes to the, the materials used and the transitions between the materials, because I think that that obviously when it comes to cars and especially car interiors in terms of the material finishes and the transitions between them, I, I think is really well done. Yeah. It's, it's a really impressive thing to make something feel so unified that is made of so many different materials. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. The, the thing that I don't always like about car design is that I feel like right now, I, I don't really feel that car design, you know, different car companies feel that distinct from one another. Yeah, it is like you look down the street and is it a Honda or a, or a Toyota? Who yeah, knows? and I I don't know. I, I kind of look back at the the cars of old and it seemed like back in the 60s and the 50s there was real there was a real character to every car company and maybe this is maybe this is ill informed and if any automotive designers out there want to educate me I I would be happy to learn but uh yeah it felt like it felt like there were more distinct you know visual features of every car company that you know that separated them from each other I, and um now it just feels like everything's kind of the same everything's very streamlined i i kind of am curious about this topic maybe this is like a whole nother topic but um it's it's interesting because i i'm just completely like speculating and kind of like just seeing this is this is what i've observed but like i kind of see this idea of all these cars got more streamlined because of this need for like, oh, we got better gas mileage. You know, mm. the the economical need, right? Right. Like, oh, if you get this car, it's very streamlined. It's very, you know, the price, you know, you can fill up your car for 30 gallons and drive 600 miles. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's very cheap. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that, dro- like the marketing of that drove a lot mm. of these companies to really streamline the cars. And that's why there's not those crazy, you know, 50s, 60s, like right. wing flares. and Yeah, I think there's definitely aerodynamics are playing a part. Um, I, I think that like in terms of uh, car companies and car design, I mean, how do you feel about Tesla? I like Tesla. I mean... I, I like Tesla as like a holistic vision. Mm-hmm. I mean, their styling is nice. Again, it's very simple, very like streamlined, um, but but definitely beautiful. Um, I, I mean, I'm a heavy investor in Tesla. Like, I I be- <laughs> I, I just believe in Elon Musk and right. and his vision for the future of everything. Yeah, and I feel like that will you know funnels back down into Tesla. Yeah. Um. But, but yeah, I I think I think like. Elon Musk is definitely thinking about Tesla's more as, as more of an experience as a car. Yeah. And I think that's where the entire automotive industry is heading. It's we're not designing that. Like I think the outside of the car is not going to be the thing anymore. It's going to mm-hmm. be like an outside of a building. Yeah. We, I mean, you know, architecture is a thing, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no. All our architecture is just oh, no. listening. I think, um, I mean, I think once we get to autonomous vehicles, it's going to be a big shift in terms of car design. I feel like it's going to be all interior then. Yeah. Very much heavy on the but interior. But no, I mean, I still, I still think that exterior, because it's going to change, it's going to change where the focal point of the, of the car is. And especially not only autonomous, but electric, it's like, it's going to just be able to change the architecture in a pretty significant way. Yeah, I can see that as well. I mean, well, this is two industrial designers talking about automotive right. design, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I think that, I think that there are a lot of applications of 
of the the sort of skills that automotive designers have when it comes to industrial design and i think probably the reverse like i think uh but i'm i'm curious what role an industrial designer would take at a, at an automotive company well i think and maybe this kind of ties back into jason's question of i i can foresee a future where industrial designers are much more heavily involved in the design of interiors per se you know you're thinking about furniture now you're thinking about modularity Mm -hmm. uh you know all our our vehicles are autonomous you know there's vehicles that are now meeting rooms Mm -hmm. there's vehicles that are now like pseudo houses maybe they're sleeping vehicles i mean this is the the far out future but yeah at that point that's far out yeah at, at that point you are you know you are designing objects that are in cars yeah well and but that then asks begs the question what about interior designers oh they would uh, james don't throw a wrench in this (laughs) don't throw a wrench in my argument i want more interior designers in car design there we go um but i i think that's yeah yeah thanks for sending in jason um and yeah of course if you guys have a question send it into minor details podcast at gmail.com i also will say we're low on questions actually we've gone through a lot of them um, right and if you yeah send us a question yeah we haven't Voice sent out a call in a while so yeah we gotta uh, do that um of course every week we like to shout out a designer who we think's doing interesting work and this week we wanted to shout out joshua skirtich on instagram who has his phone number as his instagram handle <laughs> uh it is three three zero dot two zero four dot two five nine zero and i hope that he's okay with me uh telling his telling everyone that this is his phone (laughs) phone number because it's on his public instagram so yeah uh, i guess he's okay with it yeah uh joshua is a designer a design student at Mm -hmm. pratt currently Mm. um in the neighborhood i met up with him great guy oh cool does a lot of really cool conceptual work um the one that we're pulling up right now that james is looking at was a tape dispenser that is inspired by the uh the old like spinning toy on wire what do you call that toy oh like a yo-yo it's like a yo yo wire toy i don't know you know it was like it was like a a wire yeah and it had the little spinning disc and then like you tilted it up and down with your wrist and it would go yeah magnetic i don't know what that toy was called but yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, and so the tape dispenser takes the place of that of that yo-yo like object. Yeah. Um, yeah, really nice work. Really uh, nicely curated handle. <laughs> um, yeah. So check check him out. Uh, I'm not gonna say. Yeah, it, give him a call. <laughs> yeah, give him a call. Um, and uh, of course, our intro and outro music is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Rate, like, subscribe, Spotify, iTunes youtube yeah um and give us a call yeah one six four six four nine four forty eleven um yeah thanks for thanks for tuning in guys and of course we got the discord now yes hit us up absolutely all right and as always i'm at nick p baker and i'm at i draw on receipts peace later <laughs>